Welcome to Grace Life Church. I'm David Kinneberg, one of the teaching elders here at Grace Life. We want to thank you for joining us online and listening to our sermons online. Hope they are a blessing and encouragement to you. If you want more information, you can check out our website at glcanoka.org. Thanks and God bless. Good morning. We'll try it again. Good morning. Okay, it's just sort of like a ripple. Sort of like when you're, yes, exactly. It's just like going through, do the wave. So this morning, I was getting ready. Muffy's getting ready. And she looks at me and goes, because she's watching me, what are you looking for? Now, I have several pairs of glasses around. Only one of them are a decent pair of glasses. And I'm looking for my glasses. Now, it's really annoying. I, I've spent probably at this time 15 minutes looking for my good pair of glasses. I even found my not-so-good pair that I could actually see a little bit. Um, just let you know my eyes are very wonky. So, uh, but I could actually see a little bit takes her literally less than 30 seconds. It probably took her longer to ask me, what are you doing, than it did to find, find my glasses. I said, next time, could you just act like you're looking a little bit more, please? Uh, no, actually, they were in a, they were in a place... Uh, on top of her jewelry, on top of her cabinet. So she probably saw him all day. She probably, I, I'm guessing, it's starting to come to me that maybe she was just watching me for 15 minutes and enjoying me wandering around the house like a fool. What's that? Yeah, good job, Muffy. Becky? <laughs> now, uh, Another thing that I've spent a lot of time looking for, in not today, but just historically, has been my keys. And there's a great thing called, you know, the, the air tags. Some, some things have the, the tile, but I have air tags, which, by the way, the battery needs to be replaced on that. I need to remember that because otherwise I will be looking for my keys sometime. That has saved me literally hours of time of looking for things. Uh, by the way, I used to think it was entirely me forgetting where my keys were. Um, our youngest is back home with us, and one day I searched all over the house looking for my keys. And uh, he goes, oh, sorry, I borrowed your keys because he was using my truck. And I, okay. So there, there's a little bit of gaslighting that has went on in the history. But I, I am notorious. I'm getting better. <laughs> she shook her head, no. I'm getting better about not forgetting things. But uh, that has been something historically since I was little. My parents used to call me the absent-minded professor so uh, because I forgot different things. And I've worked on it by getting air tags. <laughs> so, uh, but there are certain things that I've never forgotten. I've never forgotten my wife's birthday. I've never forgotten, yeah, there you go. Yes, <laughs> thus I'm still alive. By the way, her birthday is on Orthodox Christmas. Uh, yeah, so January 6th. So there's another reason. Well, anyway, yeah, we won't go there. There's also, I've never forgot our anniversary. There's certain things that are important. If you've forgotten certain things, that's, yeah, okay. Uh, you'll spend some time looking, or you may just give up and say, it's gone. But there's certain things that we cannot forget. Or if we forget, you know, if I forget my wife's birthday, it'd be at my own peril. In Proverbs chapter 3 this morning, we have a command here about not forgetting. And as we look at this, I just remember 
um, Proverbs chapter 2. In fact, if you go, I don't remember Proverbs chapter 2. Uh, after this morning, it would be worthwhile reading through that. Uh, basically, Proverbs chapter 2, the father warns the son against perverse and violent people and also people that are given over to their lust. Warns, don't, don't go after either one of these people. They will, they're destructive. They will destroy your life. Don't, don't go that direction. And chapter 3 is the continuation of this admonition. By the way, chapter 3 expands this further beyond just those two aspects. And we'll see that as, and we're not going to go all the way through Proverbs chapter 3 this morning. We'll get down through, my plan is to get down through verse 8. Let's go to Lord and word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we come before you. We thank you that you are a holy God. Sometimes your holiness can make us shrink back in fear. But Lord, the fact that you are a holy God is exactly why we can turn and trust you. You are not going to do evil. You will only do good, and you will only do justice. And Lord, we can trust you, and we can rely upon you. As we look at your word, let us be admonished, let us be encouraged, let us find hope. We'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Proverbs chapter 3, and we're starting at verse 1. We have this admonition in verse 1. He says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Now, again, it starts off with this admonition not to forget his commandments. And it's, it's, there are certain things that we forget by, by accident. Again, I've had to learn to be purposeful about certain things. That if I'm going to remember it, uh, for example, I joked around about my keys. Part of being purposeful about not forgetting it is actually putting that little air tag on it and having a place to put it. I put energy and effort into remembering it because it's important. And this idea of forgetting, a lot of times when we forget something, it's because of neglectfulness. And this is a strong way of saying that we're to remember it. It's not something to be passive, it's something to be active. And the reality is our tendency of, as a human being is to forget the things of the Lord and to go off of just fly by the seat of our pants when it comes to life. But God wants us to remember his commandments. He wants us to remember his teaching. And we'll see the why for that in a second. Look at the second part of verse 1. It says, but let your heart keep my commandments. Now, one of the things when we're reading the Old Testament, especially in the poetic portions of the book, there's a thing called Hebrew, Hebrew, Hebrew there we go, parallelism. Say that a few times. I tried to say it once. <laughs> Where you have a statement and then you have a parallel statement. And this is exactly what's being done here. And it's a great teaching form. It's a great way of learning here because you have one command and then it's stated in another way where we can understand it better. It says, but let your heart keep my commandments. What's the, the opposite to forgetting it's, it's uh, keeping the commandments. And let's look at some of the words here. First of all, I want to think about the word here, keep. The word keep has the idea of guarding. It, it's something that we actively make sure that we're, we're, we're engaged in not letting this, this go. If you had something valuable, you put it in a valuable spot and you protect it. If somebody came to you and gave you a, a big old brick of gold, you won't use that to hold down a flower pot on the front porch. You're going to put that in a special place. You're going to keep it. So it, it shows some activity. It shows some importance. Now, the very, very first part of the second 
after the conjunction here, let. When, when we read that word, let your heart, it, we almost get the idea of let your heart in our English vernacular. We think, let your heart. Well, your heart wants to keep it, so just let your heart do it. That's not really what is being uh, the intention of what is being stated here. Our hearts are, are deceitful, and we have to be careful about our hearts. We live in a day and age where it says, you know, follow your heart. The difference between the biblical idea of what we're to do with our heart and what uh, the world's idea is, is we need to be filling our heart with the right things, with the commandments of God. And when he says here, let your heart, it's the idea of something that is a consistent activity. Not something, okay, just let your heart do whatever. You know, uh, I, we have three dogs in our house right now, and I love each one of them. We have a gate that goes to, we have a half wall, and we have a gate against the half wall. So when you open the door, the dogs can't shoot out the door. Because you know what would happen to our dogs if we didn't have the gate? They would shoot out that door. Uh, the other day, they, I had the garage door open, and the big garage door open, and the big dog pushed the small garage door open. I didn't see him go out, but I was doing some dishes or something, and I saw big, you know, medium-sized dog and little dog go trotting by and yelled at my son, hey, Nate, the dogs are out. And we had to run and chase them down. We guard our dogs because they're important. There's a consistency. We've set things up where they don't escape. We need to have that intensity and practice and activity to make sure our heart is what it should be. Let me say this, and this is a little not too far afield here, because we're going to see this several times as we look through these, this passage. God is very concerned about our heart. Now, a heart is sort of a, a breadbasket terminology in the Bible that takes in all that internal part of us. You know, our spirit, our soul, our intellect, our mind, our will, that all the inside of us, the part that nobody can see except by what we say and by what we do. It, that heart is that inside, that, that intellect and emotion and will of us that needs to be guarded and kept and filled with God's commandments. Why do we do this? Now, God gives us commands because, man, he wants us to perform, right? Right? Is that what God is about? Okay, they're doing everything exactly the way I want. No, I'm happy. No. That's the world's religions, by the way. Is I want to see your performance. If you do these things, I don't care about the rest. The world is very performance-oriented. God is very heart-oriented. Because you know the thing is, if you get the heart... You don't have to worry about the performance that follows. If the heart is right, the activities will be right by result. So God isn't performance-oriented, but he is love-oriented. And this is something that we see in verse 2. For the length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Now, first of all, this is... Uh, a pretty great promise, but we have to dig into this and not just look at it in the sur surface level. There's a, a sense where our life is but a vapor. The Bible talks about that. It goes by quickly. That's one of the things every time you hear about somebody, I remember watching as a kid, you know, on the television or whatever, and they die, and like, really? I didn't know they were old enough to have that happen to them. I'm like, Wow. Our life is but a vapor, and there's a, a sense where there's some comfort in that, that, man, this life speeds by fast, and then eternity, because eternity is going to far outshine our experience here. Well, why doesn't God just immediately, boom, take us to heaven? 
There is something special about this life. In fact, when we look into the New Testament, one of the reasons why husbands should love and pray and be careful in the way they treat their wife is because we're heirs together of this grace of life. It's a gift. Being able to live here is a gift. Uh, even the angels, when they look down on the believers that have the salvation, they're, they're wondering about it. They're wondering about this life, and uh, it's, it's a special gift. And despite the sorrows and troubles, and by the way, it's easy to look on other people and go, man, their life is so much easier than mine. The reality is everybody has their headaches and struggles and sorrows and problems. And, uh, you know, if we had their problems, we'd go, oh, yuck, I, I want my problems back. And life can be hard, full of bumps and bruises. What is it saying here? You know, by the way, if you're living a tough life and you hear this for the length of days and years of life, uh, that doesn't sound exciting. Why would I follow those commands? Well, because we need to understand exactly what is being intended by what is being said. Let's, let's think of it this way. For the fullness and richness of life will be granted to you. So it's not that you're going to have necessarily a super long life. I want to live to 120. What is talking about here? Length of days. Have, have you ever had a day where you, you go by and it just was so cram-packed with things that were fun and exciting and just, man, that was a great day. And it just sped by. That's the idea. A life that is full. It's going to be cram-packed. Length of days. Also, even more important, when we go through life, man, you know, that day was a good day. It's also going to have the idea that there's going to be a significance to it. Think about this. Jesus Christ lived 33 and a half years. That's not long days. And we know he definitely kept God's commandments. Okay, you know, by the way, as we're looking at Proverbs, there is a principle and generality to these descriptions. It's not a guarantee, man, I kept God's commandments, I'm going to live to uh, 110 now. That's not what is, again, being insinuated here. It's, again, it, our life is going to have significance, and it's going to have meaning. Jesus Christ, living 33 and a half years, keeping God's commandments, has had far greater significance than anyone ever before or ever since. You want meaning in your life? Here's a little excursus, a little rabbit trail here. I was, uh, and if I say his name wrong, you'll forgive me, Neil Tyson DeGrasse. Uh, do I have that sim somewhat similar? He, he's a very interesting scientific guy, unbeliever, uh, very uh, well-spoken, but I'll, I'll listen to him. Him and some physicists were talking, and they're all materialists, okay? You know what the difference between a materialist and us is? Materialist believes all there is is this. You know, way back when, nothing suddenly become everything. Boom! Okay, how does nothing become something? Well, the Bible does say, out of nothing, everything was created. So they're almost right. But they don't believe in God. And they believe all there is is these things. Now, this and this, you know, whatever you see, touch, smell, that's all there is. And if you talk to a genuine materialist, who doesn't venture into any philosophy, which they have no right to do if they're a materialist. They are very deterministic. What do you mean? They believe at the very moment that the universe blew up into existence, everything that was going to happen was already determined to happen. Sounds very Calvinistic, but anyway... They believe that. It is all done. Boom. 
So basically, if you see something, you were designed to do that, you were planned to do that because of the physics of everything. You know, what a depressing, nihilistic worldview. Anything I say or do, it's really not me saying or doing it, it's just predetermined. No significance. What is the great thing about keeping God's commands? Our lives are filled with significance. You know, if you take a rock, throw it into a pond, you know, big splash, and the ripples go on and on and on. That's our life. When we follow God's commands, those ripples are going to ripple on into eternity. Your life is significant. Wow. And the more we follow God's commands, the greater the size of those ripples into eternity. For a length of days and years of life, these are going to be added to us. And look at this last portion of verse 2. And peace they will add to you. Now, there's peace where I'm not arguing and fighting with everybody that comes around me. You know, it's, uh, that's good if you have neighbors and you're not fighting with your neighbors or fighting with people at work or getting shot at or anything such as that. Those are great things. But that external peace, we don't have any control over. Well, we have some control. We may not be starting fights. But there's people that live in countries. You know, uh, there's believers that are experiencing a great deal of conflict. Uh, we have brothers and sisters in Christ in Ukraine that are experiencing conflict that is pretty brutal. This isn't the peace that God is looking at. It's talking about an internal peace. Paul and Silas were beaten and thrown in a prison. And what did they do? They sang and rejoiced. Like, well, I don't want to get beaten. No, I don't either. I don't want to be thrown in a prison. I don't either. There's some people that can be put in a mansion and fed caviar and steak. And their life is full of turmoil. See, our circumstances do not determine peace it's our relationship to our Heavenly Father. We can have that peace. That is pretty wonderful. Now, following on this, and this does refer back to Proverbs chapter 2. Look at verse 3. It says, Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Let me just... Start at the very end here. If you notice, God is continually talking about the heart. We'll talk about what this means about the tablet here in a second. But let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Now, this is referring to the marriage relationship. And again, back to Proverbs chapter 2. You know, there's people that have experienced divorce where... Uh, they're not the person responsible for it. In fact, when it comes to life, there's one person that we're responsible for, and that is ourself. So what he's saying here is he's laying this responsibility upon his son that he's talking to. And what should we take from this for us as believers? How should we handle life? Now, when I think about my relationship with my wife, here's the command. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. What he's telling me is my relationship to my wife needs to be exhibiting two things. Steadfast love. This is patient and enduring love. Now, I want to say something that's a shock. Jess, you work with Muffy, and this is going to be a real shock to you. You all know I'm not perfect. No. 
<laughs> Surprise. My wife isn't perfect either. <laughs> Becky is thoroughly shocked. My wife is even more shocked. No. <laughs> You know, a lot of people stop loving because they're not getting what they want. You didn't treat me the way I want. You didn't do what I wanted. You're, and they have all these things that they expect. That's not biblical love. My wife did not bring me breakfast in bed this morning. I'm done. You, you could fill out a list of things that people put as requirements, but the Bible says, let not steadfast love. Steadfast, solid, patient, enduring love. That is different than a love that is consuming love. I, I want. This is a love that gives. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness Forsake you. To give up on those things is to be deserted. It is, there's a personification of both steadfast love and faithfulness. That they're companions that are very worthwhile to keep. And if they're gone from you, you've lost something that is, is incredibly precious. This is what that, the middle portion of this verse really insinuates. Bind them around your neck. Now, you read that, and again, you, we have to think of what the Bible is saying. Bind them around your neck. You know, I, I have in my room right now, because I'm going to be making a, a mirrored horse collar, but I have a horse collar in my bedroom right now that needs to get put together. My wife's shaking her head because... It's become a story, storage place is a, a bunch of stuff. But a you know, horse collar, you know, you put that on the horse and you bind that on where they can work. Doesn't that sound like what the verse is talking about? Bind them. Really, the idea here is not something like that. Not a yoke, not a burden, not something difficult. But it's talking more about, you know, remember, who here remembers Mr. T.? Yeah, there's a few. Yeah, about 75%. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Becky's like, yay, man, Mr. T. <laughs> Pity the fool. He always walked around in layers. Talk about the bling that he had. He had a thick, I, I don't think, I, I think I'd be walking around like this. Just layers upon layers upon layers of, you know, gold jewelry. I don't know if it was all real or not. He looked tough enough that he could wear all of that and get away with it. That's what it's talking about. Adorning yourself with steadfast love and faithfulness. So that's the picture. It is going to, it's going to decorate your life. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Now, again, the, the scriptures are very concerned about our heart. What do we think? By the way, I, I don't normally do cross-references, but somebody, uh, I'll, I'll read it here. Romans chapter 12. I could probably quote it but just where I don't misquote it. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The word there, renewal, is renovation. And it's very close to the idea that's been talking about writing in your heart, two different metaphors. It's interesting how over time, science catches up with the scripture. We can write things on our heart. It's talking about making a change to our heart. Romans chapter 12, 
1 and 2 is talking about a change to our heart. Do you, do you realize the science has just caught up with us that we can change the pathways in our mind in the way that we think? Isn't that amazing? That's what this is talking about, is taking God's word and writing that down on our heart. God's thoughts becomes our thoughts. And as we do that, what happens? Well, that sounds like a lot of work. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. There's two blessings here, favor and good success. You know what? I don't want to go too far on this, but finding favor. You know, even in our day and age, where faithfulness and steadfast love is sort of a little bit archaic, when you tell somebody, you know, my family and I have been married 30 years. You know, for me, they're like, good job. For my family, it's like, Wow, how, how do you stay around with that guy? <laughs> there's a sense of favor that is found when, when there's faithfulness there. There's favor even in the sight of mankind today. I'm like, wow. Good success. You know what? It's, I think it especially works out better for men, but men actually live longer when they're married. I think I would have already been dead. Especially helps that my wife is a nurse. Yeah, you need to go to the doctor for that. I, I've heard that many times. Now, not later. So you'll find favor and good success. There's a promise to it. God wants the best for us. In the sight of God and man. God approves of this. By the way, we have to have a balance in this. When it says here, in the sight of God and man. Now, we need to live Godward. When I do things, why do I do or not do it? Because I want to please and honor God. The balance there is, there's a lot of people that live out of fear of man. Why, why do I live? Well, I do this because I want approval from people that are around me. They walk around like, you know, little... You know, I have an empty bucket, and I need to have your approval to fill up my bucket. And my bucket has holes in it, so, you know, I better get, keep on going around and around. And if I get disapproval, somebody doesn't like me, I'm crushed. And that's a very dangerous way to live. With God, we have that constant approval. We, we stand in his grace. But in favor, there's certain things that God looks at and says, well done, right? How do I live in the sight of man? Well, I'm not going around seeking favor, but I'm doing it and I'm living so I can do things that are right, not to get, but to give. Well, when I get a favor, favor and approval for somebody, you know, I, I work hard at work and somebody says, wow, well, you did a good job. Well, I, I'm doing it to please the Lord. I'm working for the Lord. I'm serving him. But there's a way that as I'm doing that and I get that favor from man, it's an opportunity to be a blessing to them. One, I did a good job. But also, I have the opportunity to let my light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I can live in such a way that my favor that I get from mankind points them to God the Father. There's a promise, though. That's a good thing. Five through eight. Should I stop here? No, we're going, we'll go on just a few minutes. Hopefully I treat this with the, the importance that it needs to have. The third command here, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. Familiar verse. And this will be explained more in verse 7. But here, trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
You know, one of the things that happens when we hear the commands of God, sometimes we run across commands and we go, oh, that's not going to work. Uh, I, I'll share this story. I, I went to a seminary in Minneapolis, and I was going through the counseling program, and one of the counselors shared this story. And one of the other professors came, very knowledgeable, well-trained in the scriptures professor, and came to a professor by the name of Dr. Juvenal, one of my favorite, favorite men. Muffy's shaking her head, yes, just delightful man. And this person asked, what should I do here? Here's the situation. And he explained biblically how the Lord would counsel a person to handle that. And the professor turned around and said, ah, that's not going to work in this situation. I'm like, oh, you should know better. <laughs> Why ask counsel if you're not going to follow the counsel of the word of God? See, it's difficult oftentimes when we trust in the Lord. It looks like we're going to get ran over. If I trust in the Lord and I stand for the Lord, I could get in big trouble. Remember the three Hebrew children? All right, when we blow the trumpet, everybody bow down and, you know, there you just do what I'm saying. Giant figure, you know, Nebuchadnezzar sets up, the trumpet blows, and I'm sure they're going, oh, you know, this has been a nice ride. We're in a good spot, but been good. But we're in trouble now. Everybody else bows down. And I'll guarantee you there were thousands and thousands of Jewish men and women that were there on that plane where they had the figure erected. And there was three of them that did not violate God's word. And God preserved them and protected them. When we hear God's commands, we need to trust them. Lean not onto your own understanding. I got this figured out. We try to figure out things in order to protect ourselves, but we need to trust the Lord. Verse, seven, or verse six, on every Sunday acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Is that right? No, okay, sorry. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. What does this mean in all your ways? Acknowledge him. Okay, it doesn't mean every single minute, okay, Lord, I'm going to do this, you know, pray about every single decision. What it's talking about in every aspect of your life, God needs to have direction in that aspect of your life. Lord, direct me. How should I do this? What should this look like? What would you approve of me doing? Uh, the alternative to that, if there's something in your life you can say, well, God, direct me on how to do this activity. And the Lord would say, don't do it. Then don't do it. What is the promise when we trust in the Lord? We don't rely on our own faulty, fallacious thinking and we acknowledge him. He will make straight our paths. The idea is that it's not that we're going to have a path that's without problems and difficulties, but it's not going to take us to destinations that are self-destructive. It will be a direction. It'll be the correct direction. He'll take the brambles, he'll take the, the problems and the difficulties of seeing where we should go, and he'll give us clear direction. Verse 7, be not wise in your own eyes. Verse 7 is really giving this the alternative to verses 5 and 6. Being wise in our own eyes. You know, one of the things I've realized more and more as I've gotten older and older is to research things. Now, this is talking just in general of life, not just making decision. Oh, this seems right. Finding information about it. 
and making decisions based off of information. I'm not the repository of all knowledge. When it comes to the scripture and it's making life choices, we don't just figure it out on our own. We seek and find what does God say about that. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord, and we have to understand in the context of verse 5, trust in the Lord. What does fear the Lord mean? We're just saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. We serve the omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise God. And we need to have a proper understanding of who he is. I've shared this illustration like this before, but I, I've worked, in fact, I'd worked over a decade by the time I graduated from college around heavy equipment. My dad was a logger. And he was a big proponent of before you reached the age of 18, you had had powered equipment in your hands, powered tools in your hands, because you reach 18 and you haven't touched that. You get on that and you think, I know everything. Isn't that a problem with uh, teenagers when they first drive? Well, oh, I know how to drive. Yeah, men, unfortunately, are worse drivers when they're younger because they think it's in their DNA that they know how to drive. And they have no driving skills, but they know how to drive. And he was a big proponent of getting kids handling things because they were terrified. And big rubber tire skidders, if you ever see one, you need to get on one. And you need to drive it about 10 feet because, you know, the tires are about like this tall. And you go over a rock this big and you feel like you're going to roll. And you get terrified, and you're incredibly careful, and you respect the power of that equipment. Fear of the Lord is going, he said, let there be light. Boom. God is all-powerful. And if we fear him in the idea of what, wow. We're going to have a proper perspective on how we should live. When we come to the Word of God, it's not going to be merely suggestions. It's going to be life itself. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. What's going to be the result of that? And turn away from evil. And there's two types of evil that the Bible talks about. One is moral evil. Sometimes we can see that fairly easy, and the other is just playing garbage evil. Turn away from, and this is really referring to moral evil, but both evils need to be turned away from. I'm not going to do that. I fear God. He is real and especially powerful. Verse 8. It will be healing to your flesh, and refreshment to your bones. By the way, you notice each one of the times we get a command, what do we have that follows it? A promise. Thank you. Wow. You mean God is this, tell me, do this and do that and do that. No. He tells us these things because he loves us and he wants the best for us. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Again, science catches up with the Bible every now and then. There's a thing called the psychosomatic aspect. Now, it's ironic. Uh, again, a lot of times those that are studiers of the soul, psychologists, psycheology, don't believe in the soul in and of itself. Irony of ironies. But there is a mind-body connection. You realize you can be sick and ill and suffering just because of patterns of your thinking. 
Like, no, yes. You can be miserable physically because you're miserable in your thinking to the point where you ache in your bones. Uh, I could share an illustration of that. I'm not going to do it. But let me just say this here. There's a promise. Not that you're going to be without illness. If I obey God, I'm going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Well, you can be wise. The other two are not guaranteed. But there is a promise that there are certain things that will not afflict you that afflict other people because you're living in accordance to God's word. What do we say to Proverbs chapter 3? My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. When it comes to serving the Lord, we need to know God's word and follow God's word. He loves us. He's given us these directions because he's a loving God and he wants the best for us. Let me ask you, how big is God to you? What's bigger to God? What's bigger than God to you in your life? If there's something bigger than God, if there's something that you acknowledge more than God, you need to bump that out of the way and put God back where he needs to be. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we come before you. There's more in the word that you have here than what, what's been mined out today. Lord, use the words in our heart by the Holy Spirit to direct and guide us to be who and what you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.